Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Brigway. Good evening, everyone. My role today is I'm going to be looking at the mindset for financial prosperity. Okay, what does it require? What is the mindset for financial prosperity? And today, specifically, we're going to be looking at three things. And those things are number one, what is God's plan for your finances? So, we're going to be looking from the spiritual point of view. And uh, I should say this now, Temi, who, who leads the uh, financial boot camp, uh, the financial mentoring program, she's going to take over for the remaining five weeks of the boot camp. And she's going to be taking us through the more practical aspects of the natural laws, management laws, expanding and multiplying your income and all those kind of things. But I believe it is always good to set a spiritual foundation for anything that we do. So what is God's plan for your finances, which is the provision? Because God is the author and the finisher of everything. So he must source. What does that mean? What does he really want for me in my finances in terms of money? Okay. What are his thoughts towards me money-wise? Secondly, we're going to be looking at what are the money stories that are holding you back. So I've categorize those as the obstacles. So what's standing in your way? And I'm going to be showing how what you believe about money is actually setting the boundaries of your life where finances are concerned. No matter how hard you work, no matter how much you desire wealth, no matter how many ideas are coming into your life, etc., what you believe is setting the boundary for your financial circumstances. And then thirdly, uh, we're going to be looking at what are the spiritual laws of prosperity. The same way we have natural laws of prosperity, we also have spiritual laws of prosperity. You can't have one without the other. So some people will obey the spiritual laws of prosperity, but they will ignore the natural laws of prosperity and then they end up with nothing. The same way some people are very good at financial management, all the natural laws, but they haven't quite come into an understanding of the spiritual laws of prosperity. And again, I've said that is the channel so that is actually how God gets money or wealth or riches to us. And if we violate those spiritual laws of prosperity, which is God's channel to pour into our lives money-wise, then no matter how much we pray for finances, no matter how much we desire it, it really will not happen. Okay, so the provision, the obstacles, and then the channel. Okay, are you ready? All right, so the first part, what is God's plan for your finances. So what is the provision? And I'm going to be in this section, I'm going to be taking us through some of the myths. Okay. Um, things that we have been taught in terms of t- traditions, culture, in terms of, you know, old wife stills, even in the church that people have been taught that have passed from generation to generation regarding finances, regarding money. And these things are still being, you know, um, pervaded from day to day, from generation. We're passing it to our children and then our children pass it to their children's children, what we learn from our parents, etc. But which, how many of these things are actually true in terms of going and digging and searching in the word of God? So that's what we're going to look at. So what is God's plan for your finances according to his word? Because his word is his will. If I can find it in scripture, that means God, that is God's disposition towards me regarding my finances. So the first myth that I'm going to be, hopefully, by the help of the Holy Spirit, bursting today is God is against having a lot of money. And... This one is quite popular because somewhere in the subconscious of people, in fact, if you look at the history of the church, the poorer you are, the more righteous you are. That was what was passed on, you know, from from throughout the centuries. And if you look at the Catholic church and so on, you know, people would, you know, take a vow of poverty because if you have money, then you're certainly serving Satan because and they base that idea on when God, when Jesus said you can't serve God 
or mammon. Basically, you can't serve two masters, right? It's either God or mammon or money. So people think, oh, if I have money, then I'm serving money. God is God doesn't want me to have a lot of money. So if that is true, all right, if God has some kind of reservation at best or a, you know, a serious resistance at worst against having a lot of money, my question is then how do we explain people like Abraham, people like Isaac, Israel or Jacob, Joseph, David, Solomon, all these people were extremely wealthy in fact the, you know i've 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 um, read history books and they've said the wealth of solomon nobody nobody in in all the centuries since that time has ever equaled his wealth and what was the source of his wealth it was god god said because she didn't ask me for riches you didn't ask me for all these things you asked me for wisdom i will give you wisdom and in addition to that I will give you wealth. I will give you influence. So God was the source. So if God is against having a lot of money, why did he give Solomon all that wealth? Why did he make Abraham rich or Isaac or Israel or Joseph or David? These people were extremely wealthy. Is God schizophrenic? Does he favor some and then despise others? No, right? It doesn't compute. So how is he against having a lot of money. So that's the first one. And then the second one I'm bringing up is, okay, what about Jesus? Okay. Um, and the angle that I'm going to come from, you know, different people have tried to say that, you know, they cast lots for Jesus's coat and it was expensive. I don't know about the Bible. I mean, I don't try and, you know, insinuate what the Bible doesn't clearly say. Okay. Um, I don't think Jesus was poor. I don't know if it was poor. The Bible says it was made poor for our sake, right? But I, what the Bible does not explicitly state, I'm not going to try and manipulate it to say, right? But look at what the Bible says here. And this is what I'm trying to point out. Says, so he was talking about Jesus and his ministry and the people that followed him, the disciples. And then he began to name some of the women, for example, Mary Magdalene, that he cast out seven demons from. He now goes on to say in Luke 8, 3, that among the women were Susanna and Joanna, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who managed King Herod's household. Now, I want you to pause for a minute. So this is like chief of staff. This person was a person of influence. And his wife says many other women who supported Jesus' ministry from their own personal finances. So they were not poor. If they were poor, they would not be given to Jesus. And if Jesus was against having money, he would not have associated with them. He would not have had anything to do with them. He would have said, oh, you're rich, get out of here, you know, you're filthy, I don't want to have anything to do with you. These were women that were rich, that had money and were followers of Jesus and they supported, they invested, they poured money into his ministry. So God is against us having a lot of money. We've seen here from Jesus' example, if that is the case, Jesus would not have associated with these women. And if that was the case, God would never have poured as much riches and wealth as he did into Abraham, Isaac, and all those. And these are just examples that I've written out off the top of my head. So that is myth number one busted, that God is against us having a lot of money. God wants us to be poor. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. The second one, Oh, before I move on to the second one, it says, what is God really against? All right. When you read about wealth and the rich man, it is more difficult for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle and all those things that sort of, you know, display wealth in a negative light. What is he really against? And the Bible makes it clear. He talks about dishonest gain. And it talks about acquiring wealth or riches only to consume on your own selfish lusts. The Bible talks about, it says that you ask, but you don't receive because you ask to consume it on your own lusts. The Bible also talks about the man whose ground bought for harvest abundantly. But then he now said, hmm, okay, this thing has produced so abundantly. He said, now he said to himself, he says, soul, sit down, enjoy, party, just lift, you know, lift up your legs and enjoy the rest of your life and just eat and eat and eat. And God said, you're useless to me because you are not generous. You are not generous. So because he accumulated to feed his own lust, that is what God is against. 
And let me show you the scripture here, Ephesians 4.28. It says, let the thief steal no more, but rather let him be industrious, making an honest living with his own hands. Why? So that he may have, so that he may be able to give to those in need. So God is not against us having a lot of money because if you don't even have enough to eat, you will be, you'll be begging, you'll be asking people for money. But he wants us, interestingly, he didn't say, make sure you don't steal anymore so that you can have to eat. He says, make sure you don't steal anymore so that you can have to give. You can only give out of the abundance. You only give out of the abundance. So God is interested in abundance. What he doesn't want is dishonest gain. He says, stop stealing. So the person that's stealing has money. The person that has gone through God has money. So what God is saying is, eh, eh, don't steal it. Allow me to bring it into your life. Be industrious. Make an honest living. Work with your hands. And the abundance that comes to you, make sure out of it to give. Okay? So that is the myth. I'm going to go back to that myth now. God is against us having a lot of money. Okay? Now, the second myth, um, I, I want to try and keep this for an hour. The second myth, all right, myth number two, that we tend to have believed a lot of us as Christians uh, is God only wants to supply my needs. And you might say, no, God wants me to give. And we might recite all the scriptures and have knowledge in our head. But what do you really believe? Because if you really believe that God wants you to have abundance, then we would not settle for my paycheck, paying my mortgage, paying for everything, my student school fees. As long as all of that is fine, I'm okay. If you say, I'm okay, I have my savings, my mortgage is taken care of, I bought my house, and you know, my school fees, children's school fees are sorted, and then you pretty much have nothing left. Right, you say, okay, maybe I give my tithe, maybe I give some offering, maybe I give you know 10 pounds to charity or whatever it is. It's much more than that. All right, it is a limiting belief to say that God only wants to meet my needs, it is not even in the nature of God. God cannot, and you know, He He cannot want us to be in a place where what is coming in is only sufficient for us. Does He want us to be in lack whereby everything that comes in you give away so that you lack? No, it's not even a biblical principle. The Bible talks about in Acts and also I believe in 2 Corinthians when Paul was talking, they talked about how nobody had less than they needed. So he doesn't want you to be lack. So if the money that is coming into you is just enough for what you need, then you need to understand that God has much, much, much more in store for you. And it is not like I said, this, you know, um, give five pounds there. Somebody comes to you, give this one there. He wants us to be lending to nations. Now here's the scripture, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 12. And now says, God is able to make all grace. It says, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient that's what i mean so you don't need to go and borrow you don't need to go and ask somebody and say ah, you know the money hasn't come in please can you lend me this one or the school fees is due no 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 that's not god's plan he doesn't he wants us to be self-sufficient meaning what is coming in is enough to meet all of your needs but it doesn't stop there. It says possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance. Is it for some good work? It says for every good work and charitable donation. Meaning every time you come across something that talks upon your heart and you believe the Holy Spirit wants you to give, no more whereby you want to give and you have nothing to give. That is not God's plan. He wants us to have much more than we require. All right. He's not looking to give us only what we need. He wants to give us much more. So until we begin to think like that, right, then we will not really push for wealth and for riches. I, you know, I, I said something in the introduction when I was introducing this a few days ago, and I said, you know, someone might think, oh, but I, you know, I have what I need, but I'm, you know, helping, you know, some children there, I'm helping this. How about God passing, you know, think about someone like Bill Gates. He will take the money and say, I'm eradicating malaria in the whole of the continent of Africa. Why not us? Why not us? 
is because of what we have been taught. Uh, that has what has been taught and passed down from generation to generation in the church. People have associated money with evil. They have associated wanting to increase and generate wealth with all sorts of, you know, selfishness and things like that. So he says, now look at the second part. Verse 12 says, for the service that your giving renders does not only fully supply what is lacking to God's people, but guess what? It says it also overflows in thanksgiving to God, meaning God is the one that gets the glory. When you're furnished in abundance, when you have super abundance, much more than you need in your finances, and you are a channel, and you are giving, and you are easing people's burdens, they will lift up their voices in thanksgiving to God. God, at the end of the day, is the one getting the glory for your own abundance. Can you see that? So it's a myth to believe that, listen, I want this kind of salary because these are my expenses. And as long as we have that, I have some money to save. That's it. I have money in retirement. That's it. That is a limiting belief. And I have shown in scripture that that is not God's intention for us. Now, myth number three (laughs) says wealth turns your heart away from God. So somewhere down the lines, you know, we have been taught and some people will believe that if I, if I have all this money, (laughs) I, mean, I don't think I will serve God again or look at all these rich people, whatever it is, they're taking cocaine and, you know, they don't even acknowledge God. If you're too comfortable, you can't serve God and all those kind of things. You know, we believe that if I'm too rich, I will be overtaken by the riches and it will turn my heart away from God. <laughs> now, the scripture I'm going to share, actually, all right, is what... So I'm, I'm going to turn this on its head because I, you know, I deliberately picked the scripture because it is the one that people use to justify this the most. That, ah, no, I don't want to go too high because okay, I don't know what they're doing there. You understand? Say so no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one. So he'll be loyal to money or you would just, you know, be loyal to God. Basically, that's what people say. It says you cannot serve God and mammon. Now follow me. It says, therefore I say to you, do not worry. So I've cut out some parts of this. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Know about your body, what you will put on. Follow me. It says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So people have interpreted this and said, so you just be fasting and praying. Forget about all these worldly things, you know, all these, you know, what we eat, what money, just these things that, you know, they're ungodly. Do you just face righteousness, face salvation of souls, face, you know, praying for the sick and don't, don't, you know, don't go after these things. But wait, hang on a minute. What is... What is Jesus really saying here? Look at the next verse. It says, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Can you see what I'm saying? If somebody does not have money, if they don't have food to put on the table for their children, what occupies their mind 24 hours a day? Let's let's answer that simple question. What is forefront of their mind? If the rent is due, Eh? What is going to be your prayer point? Your rent is due. You 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 don't have money, uh, or something, or something is delayed, or the business didn't work, and you are you are pushed to the wall, and you don't have money. The school fees. That what is your prayer point? And seven days fasting, and all those things. It is money. So when we lack, that is our focus. And God, Jesus is saying. This is what this is how Gentiles behave, all right? That is their entire focus 24 7. They're looking for what shall we eat? What will we drink? What will we put on? That is not talking about abundance. And abund have you wait, ho- hold on a minute. I want I want I want to try and you know introduce some new thoughts into our minds today. Okay. Did you if you think about Abraham, when Abraham woke up with how wealthy he was. Did he wake up in the morning and say, ah, where is food going to come from today? What am I going to drink? What am I going to feed my children with? What am I going to wear? Was that even on his mind? No, because he was in such abundance that that was, it never occurred to him 
to worry about any of those things. This is when we are in scarcity, in lack, that we actually worry about these things. But when you are in abundance, when you allow God to bring you into the place of abundance, it is not an issue. It is a non-issue. Why? It says, for your heavenly father knows that you need all this. And that says, seek the kingdom of God. Meaning, what should be front and center of our minds is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. But let's be honest. How will you be doing thy kingdom come when you have bills to pay? That will be your prayer point. You will be pushing and using all your faith to produce material things because you don't have enough. He says that is how the Gentiles seek. If the Gentiles ever lift up their voices in prayer, it is, oh, you know, I, 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 I want more money. I just need God, just come and help me with this. And once it comes, they forget about God. But he says, seek the kingdom. Our own focus as children of God should be the kingdom. And God sorts everything else. He says, all these things will be added to you, meaning he will sort out your provision so that you can focus. You have the, the presence of mind, the peace of mind to focus on. You say, okay, this, mo- this month, this is what I'm, I'm going to push for the more important things of life, like the body. He says that the body is more important than the clothing. So you are pushing and praying for healing to come into people's bodies. He says the life is more important than what you eat or drink. So you see someone that's in distress and the focus of your prayers is to make sure that that person comes to knowledge of Christ. But if we don't have enough, if we're in lack or scarcity, that is our prayer point. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying if you have wealth, you can't serve God. He's saying if you don't have it, the focus of your entire life is going to be on getting it, like the Gentiles do. Hmm. So it is a myth to think wealth will turn your heart away from God. Wealth, actually, when you enter into abundance, it frees you to serve God with more zeal because you're not encumbered by where if your house is paid for, you bought your house cash. You know, you're not thinking mortgage is coming out. What is happening? That's not what you're thinking about because everything is sorted. You are in abundance. You are giving. You are helping people. The focus of your prayer is on bringing salvation, the kingdom of God to be established through you and in the lives of other people. So it is a myth to believe that when we enter into abundance or into wealth, it will turn our hearts away from God. That's myth number three. Number four, and there's this one, if we, you know, for most of us who come from like Africa, um, Nigeria, all those places, and means number four is that we say extravagant living or extravagant display of wealth automatically equals ungodliness. I mean, some places, in some cases, we know not everybody is godly. Some people have gained their wealth through ungodly means, but as soon as we see Sometimes the people that hold on to this belief, as soon as you see someone that drives a nice car or does is that, uh, uh, why must you be driving that? Uh, now, wow, why must you be sending all these students to all these kind of schools? Uh, do you understand? <laughs> okay, this is what I want to show. There are two scriptures that I'm going to show us. Here's the first one. The Bible says in Second Corinthians Chronicles 2-2, it says Solomon gave orders to begin construction on the house of worship. So that's the temple in the honor of God and what? And a royal palace for himself. What is my point? After he, and if you, if you read your Bible, you will know that he didn't build a wooden shed as a palace for himself. It was gold, 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 gold everywhere you turn, gemstones everywhere you turn, right? It was extravagant display of wealth. If somebody saw that and said, oh, hey, see you, you, all the money God gave you, see what you spent it on. Not knowing that this same person has spent God knows what. In fact, they talk about the amount of money that he gave in gold. So I, I think it was, um, I heard the minister talk about this, how if you, if you take the amount of gold as the Bible records it and you convert it into today's worth, he gave billions of dollars from his own personal treasury, and so did David, into the building of the temple. 
So someone might be complaining and say, huh, see this, see this, um, this is royal palace that he built for himself. Uh, you know, they don't know that he's already given billions of dollars to build the house of God. So it is a limiting belief to see somebody being extravagant in their display of wealth and to automatically assume that they are being ungodly. Some are, but to automatically assume that eh, eh, it is not right, it is ungodly. Can they, can they sell it and give it to the poor? Can they do this? You don't know what they are doing. In fact, I have heard of people, ministers and people, or business people, actually particularly business people, that are making so much money, they live on 10%. And they give away 90%. But that 10%, if you see what they're driving, if you see where they're living, you will be like, ah, why can't you just... But you don't know. You don't know that 90% they are given. They are only living on 10%. Someone I heard even lives on 5%. And they give 95% away to help people into the kingdom, to build schools, all sorts of things, 5%. So it is a myth. And it is a limiting belief that will keep us, the person that's thinking that thought, captive to think that if I'm being extravagant, right, then it means I'm being ungodly. So I, I don't, I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to just, you know, if I have money, I'm not going to buy new clothes. I'm not going to, you know, display myself. No, well, I'll just keep the money, keep the money, keep the money. This is the second scripture that I'm going to show. It says in Mark 14, 3 to 7, <laughs> Jesus was at Bethany, a guest of Simon the leper. While he was eating dinner, a woman came up carrying a bottle of very expensive perfume. And I, I did some research on this and they said if he had sold, so when um, in another version, in another part, I think it was Matthew, when, what's his name? Judas said he could have been sold for XXX, right? Amount of money. And I looked into that and that was a year's wages. All right, perfume. Somebody, so a laborer, a manual laborer working in the field, it was a year's wages. Okay, so very expensive perfume. Opening the bottle, she poured it on his head. Some of the guests, the same way we too, say, ah, ah, now wow, became furious among themselves. That's criminal. It's a sheer waste. This perfume could have been sold for well over a year's wages and handed out to the poor. So they swelled in anger, nearly bursting with indignation over her. But notice what Jesus said. Why didn't Jesus agree with them? Why didn't Jesus say, uh uh, Mary, Seth, you too? Uh uh, what kind of behavior is this? Go and sell it and give it to the poor. This is waste. No, Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you giving her a hard time? She has just done something wonderfully significant for me. It says you will have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives. And hang on a minute. Do you know that it wasn't really Mary they were criticizing? It was Jesus. They were criticizing Jesus for accepting that gift, for being a partaker of that, what they call sheer waste. That why didn't Jesus stop her and say, no, no, uh, no, don't put it away. Let's sell it. There are people that are hungry. Jesus said, listen, the poor, and I know this may rock some boats. But hear me out. He says, you will have the poor with you every day for the rest of your lives. Whenever you feel like you do something for them, but not so with me. So Jesus is saying, listen, I sacrifice and I sacrifice and I give. But on this occasion, I will enjoy this wealth that is being poured upon me. I receive it and I enjoy it. Why? Because I'm not here forever. And the poor will outlive me. They will all, listen, if it's, if it's, Say and oh, I'm I'm not you know until I do this and I'm not going. You are here for a while. You are also a child of God. This is this is actually how God explained it to me all those years. He said, "Do you know that like, you too? I want you too to enjoy this life. So it's not just about other people. I want you too to enjoy life. To to you know to walk in abundance. To have more than you require. So." If you see an extravagant display of wealth, it does not automatically equal ungodliness because you don't know the backstory. You don't know the backstory. So give yourself permission to enjoy your life while you're here, not to consume on your loss, right? So Jesus is saying, give to the poor, but at the same time, enjoy your life. At the same time, enjoy your life. 
Okay? So that's myth number four. And I believe that's the final one that we're going to look at. So the second part, part we're going to be looking at is what are the money stories that are holding you back? So the first one is what is God's mind and intention towards you? And I've looked, I've come from the angle of myths, the things that we may have believed that have, you know, distorted the image of God or his disposition towards us when money is concerned. So in terms of money stories, you say, what are the money stories that are holding us back? And these are the obstacles. So the first one, I want to explain this. Okay. Now look look at the scripture. I love the scripture (laughs) because it was how God showed me basically that your internal work is basically um, responsible for your external life. All right. So it says, Proverbs 23, 6 to 8. It says, do not eat the food of one who is stingy and do not crave his delicacies as he calculates the cost to himself This is what he does. He tells you, oh, eat and drink. But he doesn't really mean it. You will vomit the little you have eaten and spoil your pleasant conversation. Now on the surface, and this is a scripture basically in in NKJV that says, as a a man is, um, as a man thinketh, so he is, okay? In his heart, so he is, all right? This is a different translation. But this translation brings out the true meaning of that scripture. Now, if you look at this man, the characteristics of this man is the Bible says that this is a stingy man. So his makeup, his character, his image inside him is that of a stingy person. But he's trying to put on an appearance of a generous person. So he's inviting his friend over and he's saying, eat as much as you like. But he doesn't mean it. So there's a conflict between his actions and his beliefs. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says at the end of the day, it is what he believes that wins. Why? Because he never wanted his friend to have that food in the first place. And what happened? The man vomited it, meaning that stinginess inside him, that image inside him forced that man to give up what he didn't want him to have in the first place. That is how powerful your internal beliefs and your internal images about money are. So you might say, oh, you know, I want to be rich. I want to be able to give. I want to be able to da 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 But what have you heard? What have you grown up you know, learning about money? What do you believe about money? Because if that will regulate your life, no matter what you try and do on the outside. Okay? And I have said here that it is a fact that the beliefs you have accepted about money are efficiently creating your financial experiences in life. I use the word efficiently, intentionally, meaning it doesn't fail. It doesn't fail. Even if someone tries to bring you into something prematurely that you have not grown into, it is only a matter of time before everything dissipates on the outside and you come back to that level of what you believe. Lottery winners are the perfect example for that. They win all this money and you will hear that within a year they have lost hundreds of millions of pounds. Sports people as well, they have talents, they do all these things and a lot of them end up broke, bankrupt. Why? Because they, most of them come from poor backgrounds, poor homes. So their beliefs about money were never addressed. So all this money came. Nobody sat them down to say, listen, what are your stories about money? You need to change those stories. And because they did not change those stories, it ended up being that they lost everything. So the beliefs you have accepted about money are efficiently creating your financial experiences in life. Okay. All right. So three things that I know, three questions that I'm going to ask you. What are the money stories holding you back? The first one, or what are the obstacles? What have you heard about money? And usually it is growing up. So what did your parents tell you about money? Ah, money doesn't grow on trees. What did they tell you about money? What did you keep hearing? If they say money doesn't grow on trees, what's the translation of that? It means it's scarce. It means it's scarce. It means it's hard to get money. What did they say? What do we hear growing up? Ah, you must work till you quench before you can get real money. People say you must work and work and work and work and sweat and almost die in that job. And, you know, before you can get a good size of money. These are things that we may have heard. That the stories that are working, that are running our lives. 
the stories that are working and are running our lives. It says, rich, you know, some of the things that we have told, we have heard, you know, especially if some of us like grew up in like maybe working class uh, or lower middle class or middle class uh, back in Africa or whatever it is. Say, ah, rich people are snobs or, you know, I remember on our street, you know, there was this very wealthy rich man growing up. Um, and my, my family, my parents were professionals, but like, you know, like middle class, we were, you know, they said comfortable, quote unquote. But there was this man that, were, you know, that lived on a street that was very wealthy. He had a massive mansion. It, in fact, it was directly opposite the house I grew up in. And for me, growing up, because then, you know, they, growing up, we were not <laughs> allowed to interact. So that, no, all these rich people, you know, they're snobs, they're this, they're rude, they're this. They will just, you know, they won't greet you, all those kind of things. And it was later as I grew older that I actually became friends, began to interact, you know, ignoring whatever I was told, began to interact with the children that were like my age. And I found out that, ah, hang on a minute, they're just like me. There's no difference. There's no difference. They, you know, misbehave sometimes. They were clever. They were intelligent. So, Having some of these money stories, and I'm not going to read through them all. So I have a list. I can share that list with you. Some of the things that we may have believed about money that is causing, that is causing, um, that is that is actually regulating our lives. So, uh, so as a child, if you have believed that rich people are snobbish, uh, you say, uh, me, me, I don't want to be like that. Though I have enough to be comfortable, to pay my bills, to be able to give here and there, but to be rich so that you enjoy people's attention, whatever it is, I don't want that. So what have we believed about money? We hear that, you know, you can't be, you, you, you know, money, more money, more problems. Where did that come from? More money, more problems. We have to be careful. We have to dig deep. The second one is what have you seen about money? What did you observe? from your parents' relationship with money. Did they spend all their salary before the end of, before the money even came by borrowing? Do you understand? You know how they used to do it then? The, man, the woman that has a kiosk that sells rice and, and, uh, and all those things. And then, you know, they used to like buy a list and all those things. So, you know, we observe that sometimes our mothers, they've, they've spent all their salary by buying lists, the latest list and all that before the salary even comes. What did you observe from your parents' relationship with money? Did they spend everything that came in? You know, did they hoard? Did they say, no, no, you know, we don't know what will happen tomorrow, so we can't buy this. If you ask for anything, say, no, 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 we can't afford this, we can't afford that. What did you observe in your relationship? And the third one is, what notable experiences have left a lasting mark on you regarding money? And I remember, and... The way I was able to overcome this, it became a money story, but for a very, literally for days, because by that time, God had begun to teach me about these things that I'm teaching now. And I remember I was then, my mom had retired. Uh, it was just me and my mom at home. Everybody else was abroad, basically. And we, we got, because my mom had retired, she had, you know, invested all of her retirement money into a business. The business basically failed catastrophically. So there was no money coming in. So we got behind in the rent for months and months and months. That's how one day they just showed up, landlord showed up and said they're kicking us out. I said, so it was traumatic, do you understand? But thank God that I had begun to walk with God at that time. So I didn't fall apart. My mom did because she, she was just like a baby Christian at that point in time. For me, I was solid. I, was, I had seen God do a rich, rich, do you understand, in my finances. So I was just solid and established in him. So I literally went to him and I said, God, what are you saying about this situation? He gave me a word. You can't declare. God gave us favor. And I know, so basically that situation was re resolved. But I can imagine that if we had been thrown out of the house, it would have definitely left a mark because it would have been a traumatic for someone, you know, that was pretty much comfortable growing up to come to the point where you don't even have food to eat and they're throwing you out onto the streets. These are traumatic experiences about money, right? That have left marks on our souls that we need to go back and deal with 
because otherwise it will cause fear. It might, you know, it might, it might manifest itself in the form of fear. And I think, oh, oh, because I don't want this to happen to me, this is what I'm going to do. And you cannot operate out of the place of fear. So those things have to be addressed, right? They need, you need the Holy Spirit to help you identify them and to address and destroy them by the power of God because they don't serve us and they are holding us back. All right, moving on. And the last one that I'm going to touch on today is what are the spiritual laws of prosperity? What are the spiritual laws of prosperity? And I have deliberately called it the channel. Meaning, no matter how much we pray, no matter how much we, you know, we we want to walk with God and all those things. No matter how much I want to give, I say, oh, I see children that are suffering, that are starving. Oh, God, just give me money. If you just put this finance in my hands, you know what I would do with it. If we are not following or if we are violating the spiritual laws of prosperity, we're literally cutting off the channel that God will use to get money to us. Okay, we have the first one to obey will be the spiritual laws of prosperity. And then after that, you now need to put into effect the natural laws of prosperity. Okay, so what are these spiritual laws of prosperity? You know, they, they might not be what you thought. Okay, the first one, number one, is laziness and poverty live together. There's the first law of spiritual prosperity. If you read through our Proverbs, you will see that God does not condone laziness. He doesn't condone it. He's not going to see a man that is just sitting down doing nothing and say, hey, here's prosperity. Because it would destroy him. The Bible talks about how the desire of the righteous man, of the, of the lazy man, of the slothful man destroys him. So it will destroy. So laziness and poverty live together. Laziness and prosperity are not synonymous. They don't go hand in hand. And I will tell you this, okay? A lot of the people that you see that are breaking, that are even unbelievers, they're obeying these spiritual laws of prosperity that I'm going to be talking about. And that is why they're breaking into the things that so many Christians that have access to the presence of God, they are not obeying. And as a result, it is bypassing us to go to those people. To be diligent is to invite prosperity into your laps. There's no other way. You cannot bypass diligence and expect to prosper. What are the scriptures? There are two types. There are two types of laziness that I'm talking about. So the first one is, it says the one who is lazy becomes poor, but the one who works diligently becomes wealthy. So the first one is literally, the person is just like so lazy, as in they, they would do the bare minimum. They go to work. They, they are not interested. In, in contributing to the economy of that place, they just want to get their salary. They're lazy. If they, you know, just stand, just lazy, 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 lazy. <laughs> it says it is the diligent that become wealthy. You cannot violate that spiritual principle. It is in the same word of God that says, give and shall be given. It is in the same Bible. So you can't say, give and be given unto me, and then ignore where it says, it is the diligent. That become wealthy. The second one, I'll keep reading, says the one who gathers crops in the summer is a wise son, but the one who sleeps during the harvest is a son who brings shame to himself. I'm going to link that with the second Proverbs 12 27. It says, Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. The second type of laziness is when God brings an opportunity to you in form of an idea or in form of a connection or in form of something, whatever. And to get up and run with it is wahala. As in, you're like, I'm, you know, I, I'm just going to be content, you know, coming home and watching TV. That, because that idea is what God wants to use as a channel to bring wealth to you. And if you are dealing with it with a slack hand, you will not enter into that prosperity. God cannot violate his word. He can't violate his principles. God is a God of principles. He is principled. So he says the lazy person will not even cook the game that they catch, meaning you, there's something in your hands that God has given you that he's expecting you to run with, to be diligent with. 
but you are being lazy with it. And as a result of that, that opportunity is literally just passing by. And the opportunity to enter and to break into abundant wealth is literally gone. So that's the second type of laziness whereby God brings an idea. He brings connection. He brings whatever it is. He says, go and do this. You do it half hour and then you abandon it. No. Laziness and poverty live together. That's number one. Number two, spiritual law of prosperity is that pride is the enemy of prosperity. Meaning a proud person, again, cannot enter into prosperity. Do you know why? Because you have to be a student, ever learning, ever learning, opening yourself up to ideas because you don't know everything. You don't know everything. Some people say, eh, well, me, I'm okay. You know, me, I'm okay. I don't, I, I already know everything. That I'm inside. This area is fine. Hey, this area is fine. Really? You're basically saying that is all that God can ever do for me in that area. Before I share the scripture that I'm going to share, I know of a particular well-known minister um, uh, you know, um, minister. So well-respected, well-known, global. And this person, honestly, you know, I, I, I was just talking with my husband and I said, I am astounded by this person's humility. As in the kind of ideas that he implements, you would think, you know, he's gone to like ministers that are way older than him and way more successful. no. The, there's some of the things that somebody, you know, in his office will say, oh, why don't you try and say, hey, okay. And he'll try it and the thing will be successful. The same way it was a slave, the servant girl that told the centurion, I said, there's a prophet in Israel. And when he was too headstrong, it was the same servant girl that said, why don't you just go and do it? So if pride, if someone is prideful, they say, no, 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 no. You are beneath me. I can't learn from you then that person cannot enter into prosperity. If you go and read the biography, autobiography of every successful person that you know, one, lasting successful, one of the things you will always come across is that humility, that willingness to learn from anything and everything. So what does the Bible say? Isaiah 28, 23 to 29. It says, does a farmer just keep on plowing at planting time? Once he has leveled his surface, does he not scatter the seed of the caraway plant, sow the seed of the cumin plant, and plant the weeds, etc.? He says his God instructs him. He teaches him the proper way. So if I say I want prosperity and I'm not seeking God's counsel, I'm not saying, God, how will I get there? And I'm observing the ways of God and saying, no, this is how I'm going to do it. Someone is speaking and saying, why don't you try it a different way? And we're too stubborn, too prideful to listen. You know, what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? Even someone that you might think, oh, but I'm far ahead of you in this area. What can you teach me? God can speak through anything and anyone. He goes on to say, uh, and the last one says, it comes from the Lord who gives supernatural guidance and imparts great wisdom. So God is the one that knows how to bring you into that wealthy place. And guess what? He's not necessarily going to write it in the cloud. All the knowledge that we need to enter into prosperity is already here on earth. So he's going to use people. He's going to use books. He's going to use someone just walking up to you and having a conversation. He's going to use a friend calling you up and say, I've noticed the way you handle money. Why don't you try it this way? If you are prideful and say, no, what do you mean? And you are, you are want to, you know, get defensive. Everyone, someone tries to suggest something, then the Bible teaches that you cannot really enter into wealth. That's the second one. So it's being humble enough to say, I don't know, I'm a child. You know, like Solomon said. Solomon said, I'm but a little child. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. God, I need you. Send me your wisdom. Show me what I need to do at all times. And he will guide. So he's talking about the farmer here that you don't just do things anyway. There's certain situations where you need different tactics and different methods. It's never one size fits all. And pride will, you know, will not allow us to be able to be, you know, to adapt in different situations. Say, I, this is why I am. This is how I do things. You know, why can't they change? No, there is a way and the manner and pride is what stops people from entering into abundance. Number three, and the final one that I'm going to talk about in terms of the spiritual laws of prosperity. <laughs> now, this is the most, 
probably common one and the most formidable one in terms of spiritual laws that we tend to break the most as Christians. And I will explain what I mean. There's so many Christians that believe that when they give, God multiplies money back to them. As in literally, you give. Because God lives upon your heart, God gives somebody or give to a church or help somebody or whatever it is. And they're literally waiting for someone to walk up to them and give them hundredfold. So if you give, God says, go and sow 500 pounds. And then you sow the 500 pounds and then you're waiting, sitting in your house. Somebody will knock on your door and then what's times 100? Is that 50,000? Someone will walk up to you and give you 50. Is that 50,000? Gosh, how long ago was I teaching math? <laughs> that was all because he gave you 50,000 pounds. Now, these have happened, but listen, it is not the rule. These are exceptions. And do you, know, do you know why we have come to believe and have that kind of mentality? It is because we have heard ministers, preachers of the gospel talk about it. But do you know that for them, their own work is preaching, is speaking? So they will have people invite them to come and speak and somebody will give them 50,000 pounds for speaking. That is the work of their own hands. That is how they earn their own living. So for someone that is an, I don't know, an architect, for example, and say, I have given. So this is how the money is going to multiply to me. You know, somebody will just walk up to me and say, here is 50,000 pounds. The Bible says grace, it will make all grace abound to you. How? It says every favor and earthly blessing. God will reign to you, will return it to you in the form of ideas. He will return it in the form of favor. He will position you in the right place for you to access, for you to work out that increase. Let's look at the scripture. So we're going back to 2 Corinthians 9.8. It says, so this scripture is talking about giving. It says, the person who gives sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who gives generously will also reap generously. So it's talking about reaping something. Okay? Now, what is it? What are we reaping? It will tell us. It says, each one of you should give just as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver and... So this is now expanding on what he's given back. What God is, what you're going to reap generously. He says, and God is able to make all grace. Amplified says, all favor and earthly blessing overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in everywhere at all times, you will overflow in every good work. Meaning what God multiplies to you are ideas, divine ideas. Divine ideas. He gives you favor. Someone looks at you at work and they say, I just love your work. And they decide, look, we're going to promote you. But if God promotes you by favor, if you have not been diligent, or if I allow pride to hinder you, then you will not fully partake. Do you understand? So all these three spiritual laws are linked. They are linked. So if God rains those ideas on you, he expects you to pick it up, to run with it and to be diligent with it because he has also multiplied grace to you to birth it on the earth. We don't sit down in the house and wait for somebody to knock on your door and say, here are the keys to the car. It happens, but it's not the norm. It says here clearly what God multiplies to us is grace, earthly favor, earthly blessing. It says, if you prove me now, the scripture that people quote all the time about type, if I do not open the windows of heaven and pour you out what? Money? Pour your cars? Pour your houses? No, it says pour you out a blessing. So there's a blessing. The same, let me give you an example. It was the same blessing that was upon Jacob that when he arrived in, um, what's that guy's name? Laban's house, he had nothing. He only came with a walking stick. But the blessing of God was upon him. Now, when he was living, he was living with all the flocks. That is a manifestation of the blessing. God did not reign. God did not send some wealthy king to come and knock on Jacob's door and say, Don't say the Lord, take. So we need to begin to shift our minds. 
And how do those ideas come if you're not spending time and listening to the Holy Spirit and spending time with him to give you those ideas? So if you're at work, he will give you ideas to prosper in that work that they will have no choice but to promote you multiple times over. He will tell you how to do your work. He will give you ideas. He will give you favor with the right people. He will just orchestrate your steps so that you enter into the right connections without toiling for it, without running around like the other people are doing. That is what you're giving multiplies onto you it is not material things and if we're sitting now looking for material things we will ignore the way god is truly doing it amen <laughs> and the other I was, i'm going to finish with this who is nine i'm going to finish with this i want to read this scripture just to buttress what i'm saying here i promise we'll finish in the next three minutes so i'm reading for you don't need to turn there and i didn't put it on the slide because it's too long so I'm going to read 1 Samuel 30. You can read it later on. This is talking about David. I'll give a bit of a backstory. This was when David returned to Ziklag and he found out that the Amalekites had taken everything, his wives, his sons, his daughters, all everything they owned and carried it away. So David prayed and got to pursue them. Now, l- let me show you what God multiplies back, how he causes grace to come to you for things to, for you to obtain material things effortlessly. This is how it happens. So it says they set up when God said, pursue, I'm with you, etc. So God gave them the word. He took all his 600 men and they started off. Verse 11 of 1 Samuel 30 says, along the way, they found, along the way, they found an Egyptian man in the field and brought him to David. They found an Egyptian man. How can you find an Egyptian man? It turned out that this Egyptian man You know, let me not get ahead of myself. So they gave him some bread to eat and water to drink. They also gave him part of a fig cake and so on. Before long, his strength returned. David now asked him, verse 13, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? Now, this is what I'm emphasizing. This man, they found him. They were going because... In terms of looking for the Amalekites, they could have spent years because they didn't know their location. They didn't know where they were. They were just going. God said go, and they were just going. And by the favor of God, he caused that Egyptian man to be right where they would pass. And it was that same Egyptian man who happened to have been the slave of one of the Amalekites, right? And he said, I will take you there. And he took them there. He literally took them there. And that was how the Bible says that they, you know, just, you know, they killed all their Amalekites and they recovered all. Let me read the scripture. It says, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? David asked him, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me three days ago because I was sick. We were on our way back from raiding and the, in the territory of Judah and Caleb and we had just burnt Ziklag. So he witnessed everything. He was the right person to tell David exactly where to go, a divine connection that just fell into his lap. That's God multiplying favor and earthly blessing to you. Now, how do we end up not accessing this favor? Imagine if David had allowed one, he had broken one of the spiritual laws, which is pride. If he had said, look at this slave boy, you are beneath me. You know, the the job in front of me is too important I have no time for this. Not valuing human life. He had just brushed him aside and carried on his journey. He would have roamed the wilderness looking for the Amalekites and never found them. If he had allowed pride to rule him, but he allowed the compassion of God to come out of him. He saw him and he, and he treated the man as an equal. He gave him something to eat. He didn't know who he was. He wasn't like he knew he was an Amalekite slave and he wanted something from him. No, he did it because he thought, I want to help. I want to help. That was his motivation. Do you know, I saw this recently. You know, when the Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid for the just, We'll just be confessing that scripture. Like Bill Gates will just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to divide this among all the Christians. Eh? Do you know how it happens? This story tells you exactly how it happens. What did his own master, the Amalekites, a wicked man, evil man, what did he do? When he fell sick, what did the man do? He abandoned him by the road. He said he abandoned him to die. That is wickedness. And it was because of his wickedness David showed up and demonstrated the love of God 
And that was how David accessed everything that belonged. That was how the wealth of that man was transferred to David. That was how it was transferred. Because we display the character of God. God will position you and your character will get you in. Your character is what will get you in. And pride is root of a lot of those things. When we feel like somebody's beneath me, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't. So that's why I'm going to stop <laughs> today. Those are the three spiritual laws that we cannot break. If we break them, then we cannot access prosperity at the level that God wants to bring them for us. 